Hey, welcome back to Phaser Tech. So if you've been following my channel, then you might have noticed that I've made a few videos about DIY guitar gear, including a video that showcases my custom-built pedal board. The majority of these pedals are custom-made clones I built myself. So if you're interested in seeing and hearing how they sound, then be sure to check out that video first. So today, I'll be starting a guide showing how I made these pedals, and also explain some concepts related to circuits that should make it easier for newcomers to get into DIY pedal building. It turns out building your own pedals isn't very hard if you have some prior experience with soldering, and even if you don't, guitar pedals are a great way to get introduced to circuits and soldering. Also, buying guitar pedals at retail price can be pretty expensive, so building your own will save you quite a bit of money. The average cost to build most of these pedals is only around $30, but that's because I planned ahead and purchase certain components in bulk, which I'll talk more about soon. This guide will actually be a series of videos split up into at least three different parts. Today's video will be a general overview, where I'll try to give all the essential information to get you started, and also give tips on how to select the correct components. In the second video, I'll actually be building a pedal and using it as an example to explain the process more in depth. That video will focus on how to make the circuit, and specifically I'll be making a clone of the Fuzz Factory which is an extremely unique fuzz that can also do some crazy oscillation effects. And in the third video, I'll be showing how I create the graphics and paint the enclosure before finally boxing up the circuit. So now let's get started on a general overview about building clones of guitar pedals. There are two ways to approach this. The first is to purchase a PCB of the specific pedal you want, but these can be a little pricey. The other option is to make a strip board by following layouts that you can find online. This is the method I'll be showing how to do, since it's the more economical choice. There are several sites and blogs that contain vast collections of schematics and strip board layouts. Pretty much any pedal you can think of can be found on these sites. Personally, I've been using tagboard effects to find most of my layouts, but I'll list a few more sites in the description as well. Something to keep in mind is that the vast majority of guitar pedals are analog circuits, not digital. Some exceptions are modern reverb and delay pedals, which are mostly digital. So you won't really find many schematics for these because recreating a digital pedal is much harder to do than building an analog pedal. The circuits found in digital pedals are typically much larger and complex, and they use many surface-mounted components which are much smaller and harder to solder compared to through-hole parts. Another reason why they're so difficult to build is because most of them use microcontrollers that require advanced knowledge of DSP programming. There are some exceptions though, and you actually can find some stripboard layouts for reverbs and delays, but they're pretty basic and are more like hybrid pedals that are mostly analog, but they also contain a digital IC that provides basic delay. For example, the PT2399 is a hybrid IC that can't be programmed in the normal sense, but rather the resistors and capacitors around it are what sets its parameters. But chips like this are for budget builds and don't provide many features or offer top-end quality compared to the more expensive digital pedals. But some of these hybrid delays still sound quite good with one example being the Wampler Faux Analog Echo Delay which I made a clone of myself. Now let's talk about the various components you'll need before building a pedal. Here's a list of all the components you'll need. Some of these items are more straightforward than others, so I'll go through the list one at a time so you know exactly what to buy. Keep in mind this list doesn't include the paint and other things you'll need to create graphics on the enclosure since there are multiple approaches to this, but I'll cover that more in another video. Likewise, this list doesn't contain tools you'll need, such as a soldering iron and wire cutters, since I'll be covering these topics in the next video. Also, not every build will require every single component on this list. For example, not every pedal will contain an op-amp. 
You can find these items on eBay and most of them on Amazon, but some schematics might call for specific transistors and ICs which will be easier to find on eBay, Mouser, or DigiKey. I've also listed a few other US-based vendors that specialize in guitar pedal components, so I recommend shopping around if you're looking for specific things. Alright, so let's start at the top of the list and talk about the strip boards, also known as Vero boards. These are the results you'll get from searching for strip boards on Amazon. The kind we want has traces like this, with each row connected to itself. Also, make sure the whole pitch is 2.54 millimeters. Something like this would not work because the traces are in a different pattern, and these wouldn't work either because these don't have traces at all meaning none of the holes are connected to each other. You'll notice some strip boards like this one are more expensive than the previous one I showed. These are sturdier and have thicker traces, but they aren't necessary for low current devices such as guitar pedals. However, in situations where you need to desolder something, they might be worth it since thicker traces are less likely to come off, but this would also depend on your skill level too. Also, I prefer to buy large strip boards and cut them down to my specific needs, but if you don't plan to do bigger builds, then you can get smaller boards like these. Either way, you'll need to cut the boards down to the specific size needed for each build. Keep in mind, these boards contain toxic materials and will release dust when you cut or drill them, so I recommend wearing goggles and a mask when cutting them, but I'll go into more detail about that in my next video. Now let's talk about resistors. There's two specifications to look for when it comes to resistors. First is the power rating. For guitar pedals, you can stick with quarter watt resistors since pedals don't use much power. The second specification is resistance. Since pedals contain a number of resistors with a wide range of values, I recommend getting an assorted pack of quarter watt resistors like the ones you see here. The more values a pack has, the better. For example, this pack only has 17 values, while this one has 25 values, and this one has 64, so that would be my choice. Some resistor values are more commonly used than others, so you might need to buy packs of specific values if you do multiple pedal builds, since you'll probably run out of just a few values. Now let's talk about capacitors. Similar to resistors, you'll probably want to buy a variety pack that comes with a wide range of values. But unlike resistors, you'll notice most stripboard layouts require different types of caps, so let's talk about the different types and why you need them. First are electrolytic capacitors, which kind of look like tiny batteries. These are most useful for power filtering applications since they offer the largest capacitance values, typically ranging from 0.1 microfarads up to several thousand microfarads. Electrolytics are quite common and also inexpensive, so I recommend buying a variety pack with a large number of values. The other specification to keep in mind is the voltage rating of the caps. This will depend on the voltage your circuit is running at. You generally want the voltage rating of your caps to be around double the voltage that the circuit's running at. Going overkill with the rating is fine. Since guitar pedals typically use 9 volts, then you should be fine with 16 volt caps in most cases. However, there are a number of pedals that run on 12 volts, in which case you should use caps that are rated for at least 25 volts. And for pedals that run on 18 volts, you'll want cap ratings of 35 or 50 volts for those circuits. Next are film capacitors which look like this in the layouts. These have better specs compared to electrolytics and are preferred in sections of the circuit where the audio signal passes through and they also come in smaller capacitance values. Unlike their color in the layout, I recommend getting these which are commonly referred to as greenies. Get a variety pack since they're inexpensive. The major drawback of these is their large physical size, especially with higher values, which can become a problem in some compact circuit designs. Film caps can also come in a box package and are considerably smaller, but they're also considerably more expensive than the greenies. If you end up building a circuit where greenies are too large to fit, then go ahead and buy a pack of the box style caps and use them only when you really need to. 
The other type of capacitors you'll see in pedals are ceramic caps, which will look like this in the layouts. These cover small capacitance ranges down to the picofarad range. You should get a variety pack of these as well. And that's all you'll need when it comes to caps. There are a few other types such as tantalum caps, but these typically aren't used anymore and are very expensive. Next on the list is diodes. These aren't as common as resistors and capacitors, but there still are a good number of pedals that use them, especially overdrive pedals. Buying a variety pack might be a good idea if you plan to do other projects, but otherwise just buy what you need if the schematic calls for them. Now let's move on to transistors, which are used for gain on the signal, and are very common in pedals. Transistors found in pedals are typically made out of germanium or silicon. Germaniums used to be more common, but are still found in many fuzz pedals today. New old stock germaniums can be purchased on eBay, and these are what I'll be using for my fuzz factory clone in the next video. Germaniums typically offer a warmer, smoother tone, while silicons are generally harsher and more aggressive. There are also different types of silicon transistors, including FETs and BJTs. If you happen to look at a datasheet, you'll see that there's lots of different specifications, and as a result, there are countless different models of transistors that have slight variations in these specs. If the pedal you want to build calls for a certain type of transistor, then you'll likely be able to substitute that particular model for another one that's similar if you can't find the one that you need. So be sure to Google it if you need to find potential alternatives. Something to keep in mind is that JFET transistors such as the J201 are becoming harder to find these days in through-hole format, but the surface mount version is still plentiful. If the schematic you want to build calls for a J201, you'll either have to pay a ridiculous price for the through-hole version, find a suitable substitute, or buy the surface mount version and this adapter here so it can fit on the strip board. You'll also need to watch out for scammers trying to sell fakes, which is quite common on Amazon, so be sure to read the reviews first. The next component on this list are op-amps. Now I could spend days talking about these and all their different uses, but when it comes to guitar pedals, they usually provide gain to the signal and basically achieve the same thing that transistors do, but with less components and better stability. Some pedals are transistor based while others are op amp based, and some have both, but neither one is better or worse. The rest of the circuit has a bigger impact on the tone than anything else. There are countless different op amps and some of them can be substituted with another model that's similar, just like transistors. But in general you should get the one that the schematic calls for. Since transistors and op amps can be swapped out for similar models and are also more prone to failure than most components, it's a good idea to solder headers and sockets on the board for them. This will allow you to easily swap them out in case one of them goes bad, or if you want to hear the difference between parts. Also wanted to quickly mention there are a number of other ICs you might encounter, including voltage regulators and delay chips such as the PT2399 I mentioned earlier. There's nothing special to know about these, just wanted to point them out in case you run into them. Now let's move on to potentiometers and trimmers. Potentiometers, or POTS for short, are basically just resistors that can have their value adjusted. POTS typically come in resistances from 1 kilo ohm up to 1 mega ohm. They come in different tapers including linear, logarithmic, also known as audio taper, and reverse log. If you plan to build several pedals, then I recommend buying variety packs of both linear and audio taper. But reverse log is much less common, so hold off on those unless you actually need them. Also, pay attention to the style knobs that the variety packs come with, as you might prefer one style over another. Trimmers are basically just mini pots that are soldered directly on the board. These typically are used for biasing and aren't super common on pedals but are still found on some of them. If you do need them, then I recommend buying a variety pack of these too. Now let's go over switches. No matter what type of pedal you build, you'll probably need a foot switch, so be sure to buy a pack of 3PDT foot switches like these here. 
When it comes to hand switches, there are a variety of different pin configurations that a switch can have. These configurations will be given by an abbreviation. A few common examples are SPST, SPDT, and DPDT. In addition to the pin configuration, some switches have two positions which are known as on-off, while others have three positions which are known as on-off on switches. Now let's talk about the quarter and sockets for the guitar cables. If you're planning to install a battery in your pedal, then you'll want to get the TRS stereo sockets like this one here. These have three prongs. If you don't plan to use a battery, then you can use the TS mono sockets like this. These cheap jacks work fine for the most part, and I still use them for a lot of builds. But I found that some of them have misaligned legs that need to be bent a little before they work well. So if you can spare the extra money, then you might be happier with the premium jacks like these instead. Speaking of jacks, there's also the DC power jack, which you'll want to get 5.5mm by 2.1mm barrel jacks like these. Or like these. They both have the same socket, but the first one requires a larger hole to be mounted in. They also look much nicer in my opinion. If you're buying a pre-drilled enclosure, then be sure to get the correct size power jack. Which now brings us to the metal enclosures. There are many different sizes and specifications available, but for pedals there are four sizes that are most commonly found. These go by the Hammond specification. The largest is the 1590BB. The next largest is called 125B. Next we have the 1590B, and finally the mini size pedal is called the 1590A. Which size you choose will depend on a few things. First is the size of the circuit itself, and second is the number of pots and switches the pedal has. Also if the pedal requires two foot switches then you'll definitely need to use the biggest size. The layouts will usually contain a description or comments with a suggestion on which size enclosure to use. If you don't want to drill the enclosures yourself, then you can find pre-drilled options to buy as well. Now let's move on to LEDs. The most common size you'll find in guitar pedals are the standard 5mm. Some pedals also have smaller LEDs that blink to indicate the speed of its time-based effects. But there's no rules on which size you need to use, so feel free to buy whatever color and size you'd like. However, mounting the LEDs can be tricky. So if you want to spend the least time and hassle, I recommend buying the standard 5mm LEDs and also getting these holders for them. Not only do they securely hold the LEDs to the enclosure, but I think they look really nice too. And finally, the last item on the list is wires. I recommend using stranded wires as opposed to solid core, since stranded wires are very flexible and less likely to break off. Guitar pedals don't use much power, so there's no benefits from using solid core. As far as gauge goes, I recommend using either 22 or 24 gauge. A multicolored kit like this one here would be perfect for pedal builds. So that wraps up the first video of this DIY pedal guide. Hopefully you guys have a better idea now of how to approach this project, and how to select the correct components. Like I mentioned earlier, in the next video I'll be showing how to build the circuit for a Fuzz Factory clone. Then in the third video, I'll be showing how to box it up and also explain how I do the art, graphics, and painting on the enclosure. So if you enjoyed this video and want to follow along, then be sure to like it and also subscribe to the channel. Also, feel free to leave any questions or suggestions in the comments below. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.